so the, um, the topic I was given was the universal call to holiness. So last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council that ended in 1965. And, um, and so we could ask, what was the principal message of the council? And I think if I were to ask you, I'd get all kinds of different answers, maybe um, changing of the liturgy or something like that. But the popes um, didn't say that. They said that the principal message of the Second Vatican Council was the universal call to holiness. That was the key message that the council wanted to proclaim in our time. And together with that, two related things. If all are called to holiness, then the laity, which make up the great, great, great majority of the church, are called to holiness and therefore have a crucial mission in the church. But they won't be able to do that mission without holiness of life. And then the Eucharist is the source and summit of the church's life and therefore the source of the holiness to which we're called. So all three points go together. We're called to holiness. The laity are called to play a huge part in the life of the church, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need to be fed by the Eucharist, and we need to offer in the Mass our struggles um, for holiness and to, to share in that mission of the church in the world. All right, so let's, um, just some quotes. Paul VI, who was the, um, the pope who um, finished the council, um, said this, this strong invitation to holiness could be regarded as the most characteristic teaching of the whole magisterium of the council. Its ultimate purpose. All right, so that's the most important thing. Um, and St. John Paul II spoke of this lots of times. He said, the Vatican Council has significantly spoken on the universal call to holiness. It's possible to say that this call to holiness is precisely the basic charge entrusted to all the sons and daughters of the church by a council which intended to bring a renewal of Christian life based on the gospel. All right, so basically, um, the principal message is that all of us are called to live the Christian life to the full. But again, it's easier to say than to, well, it's infinitely easier to say it than to do it. So, um, so what is holiness? Holiness is a property of God. Right? God is holy by his nature. And for us to be holy means to share in his life. And we can't do that by ourselves. We get that life in the church from the sacraments, right? beginning with baptism. But it's nourished above all by the Eucharist. And it's washed clean if we make it dirty by the sacrament of penance, confession. And so the holiness to which we we're called is something that we receive in the church through the sacraments, but, and it's basically sharing God's life. And what does that mean? And it means to, first of all, to believe, right? So to live by faith is to know God as he knows himself, and then um, more, uh, more significantly, to love him as he loves himself and us. And that's the virtue of charity. Right? So holiness is simply living faith, hope, and charity. Um, and we receive that through the sacraments. Um, and we, we grow in it um, as we live the Christian life. Right? And so every day we ought to be growing, even though we don't see it, in, those, in faith, hope, and charity, and thus growing in holiness of life. Yesterday, I, um, I was asked to give a talk at the seminary. We have a weekly formation talk. And the topic of the talk yesterday was a virtue, which uh, may sound unfamiliar, called magnanimity. Magnanimity means large. It comes from Latin. Mania is large, and anima is soul. So it's the virtue of being large-souled, having a big soul, which means aspiring to noble things, to things that are... Um, not being content with a mediocre life. Now, um, the ancient philosophers like Aristotle thought this was a great virtue, but it was a virtue, Aristotle thought, that only a few people could practice. And the reason he thought that was not everybody, he thought, 
could aspire to really great things because not everyone was a genius like him. Not everyone, I don't know, can aspire to win an Olympic uh, gold medal or, um, or make the newspaper headlines in some way or other. And so he thought it was um, a virtue for an elite. And sort of like um, he had another virtue that was for an elite, magnificence, to be generous on a really large scale. All right, who can be generous on a really large scale financially? All right. Trump or uh, Gates or something like that. And so a virtue for a few. The beauty of the gospel is that that virtue, not magnificence, but magnanimity, to, to aspire for really great things, for what's really noble, the gospel is basically that and um, what by our own powers would be limited to those who are best, um, who've gotten, I don't know, natural gifts in the highest degree, and thus only a few. The gospel is saying that everyone um, can achieve noble things infinitely higher than the noble things that Aristotle was thinking about. Everyone can do it, and everyone is called to do it, but we're called to do it, obviously, not by our strength, but by God's grace. And that's the universal call to holiness. It's, it's calling us to something better than, um, obviously, an Olympic gold medal, something better than any earthly aspiration. So what would be the, the greatest thing that a human being could aspire to? Well, infinite, infinite love, infinite goodness, infinite truth, infinite beauty, and that's God. And the gospel is basically the promise that that's possible. It's not impossible. And it's possible because he takes the first step and he gives us the grace to do it. And so basically the, what Christ brought into the world is the idea that every human being, and not just some select few, not some elite, not those with the greatest gifts of intelligence or memory or, or um, physical strength, um, are capable of the greatest thing, and in fact, a thing greater than we would dream of if we hadn't been invited to do it. All right, what is that greatest thing? To become sons and daughters of God, to become friends of God, to become brides of God. Right? And basically that's what it means to be a member of the church, is to be part of the bride and thus, all right, this works better for ladies, but, uh, but the fact is all of us are called to be um, brides of Christ. He's the bridegroom. Okay, so that's the great thing that we're called to. Um, and it's open to all because it doesn't depend at all on my natural intelligence, on my physical strength, on my size, but it depends on his grace and that's made, been made available through the sacraments to all. But there's a, we all know that we don't all equally attain holiness. So why is that? What's the, um, uh, the condition? Basically, the condition is that we desire it. And the more we desire it, um, the more grace we can receive. Right? But we have to desire it in, um, according to his conditions, right? And that means we have to desire it by living as he's called us to live. Um, but there's that sacrament of penance for all the times that we fail to do that. Okay. John Paul II, when he talked about um, how do we live this holiness, he used a, um, a phrase over and over again, gift of self. And for John Paul II, that was the, um, the, the text that he loved the most in the Second Vatican Council, was a text that compared um, the union of the divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? The, Father, the Father gives himself wholly to the Son. The Son gives himself back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is precisely the gift between the two, the love proceeding between the Father and the Son. And so the Holy Spirit, we could say, is the gift of self of Father and Son. 
right, the, this text that John Paul II loved from the Second Vatican Council says that um, Jesus opened up a vista closed, closed to human reason that we're called basically to enter into that communion. And therefore we're called to a gift of self. And he, it says, no one fully finds themselves except through making a sincere gift of self. And in that way we become like God. And so John Paul II applied this to everything. Right? So um, how should we live, I don't know, marriage, total gift of self. How can we explain, I don't know, um, sexual morality, the logic of a total gift of self. Whatever is contrary to that total gift of self is contrary to, say, marriage and the family, is contrary to the good of society, is contrary to my fulfillment and to um, all those who I come in contact with. Right? So the sincere gift of self, we could say, is um, the way to realize that universal call to holiness. There's a beautiful passage in one of my favorite books is St. Therese of Lisieux, Story of a Soul. And um, you, she was a saint who died at 24. And um, she would have been totally unknown, but her um, superior, which was her sister, asked her to write her memoirs of, of their childhood. And in these memoirs, she, um, she has a magnificent passage where she talks about um, she talks repeatedly about having great desires. And her desires caused her a real torment, a kind of martyrdom, because she wanted to do everything for God, but she couldn't do everything for God. For example, she wanted to be a missionary, but she was in this little convent in France. Um, she wanted, but even if she was a missionary someplace, she almost went to Vietnam, then she would still want to be a missionary everywhere else. And so that wouldn't be good enough. And then she wanted to be a, a martyr, right, to shed her blood for Christ. But there would be a problem there too. What if she was martyred in one way? She wouldn't be able to be martyred in another way. And she would want to be martyred in every way. Um, and then she would want to um, be a priest. But of course she knew she couldn't be that. She, was, she wasn't the right sex, uh, gender. And she would want to know Greek and, and Hebrew to read the gospel and the original and so forth and so on. And, um, and so she had all these great desires. And so at a certain point, she opened the gospel, at, the Bible at random, to look for light on her great desires. And the passage she opened to was the first letter of the Corinthians, chapter 12. And in that chapter, St. Paul is talking about the different charisms in the church. And he says, some are called to be apostles. And some are called to be teachers, and some are called to be healers, and some are called to, um, to evangelize, etc. And that wasn't what she was looking for, right? Because she wanted to be everything. And what St. Paul was saying, there are different gifts, and no one can have them all. And the church needs all of them. But she was dissatisfied. So she kept on reading. And what, does anybody know what comes after that? Chapter 13 of the first letter of Corinthians? It's the hymn on love. And so St. Paul says, I will show you a better way. And that better way is charity. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but if I have not love, I'm nothing. Right? If I give away all that I haven't, even I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Right? And so at that, she found what she was looking for. Because by loving all of, the, uh, all of the different ways to glorify God, even though she couldn't personally realize them, she could love them all. And by loving them all, in a sense, possess them all. And she realized that that love was, in fact, the secret of every vocation. Right? Because the martyr wouldn't give his life for God unless he loved. The apostle wouldn't um, go to new lands and evangelize if he didn't 
love. The teacher wouldn't teach the faith if he didn't love, etc. And so she saw love as the secret of her vocation and of every vocation. And she also saw that the value, therefore, of the different members of the church doesn't depend so much on what they actually do, right? Because that's ultimately not up to us, whether we're put here or there by circumstances in God's plan. What matters is that we love that plan, and that's what makes, that's the beating heart, as it were, of the church. And that's what um, makes the church holy and her members. It's called the little way, right? So the, the idea of the little way is wherever God puts us, we can practice that most heroic thing, which is love. And we're not hindered by the fact that our place seems to be insignificant, right? Because um, that, um, that love is the secret of every vocation, big things and little things. And this brings us to our next point. Another um, one of the key messages we said of the Second Vatican Council was that the laity has a great mission in the church. Right? It's not just, no offense to, um, to priests, but it's not just priests and religious who bring forth the mission of the church. 99.9% right? .9 of the body are the laity. And so the laity are called to build up the church um, as Christ, as cooperators with Christ. And that means to share in Christ's mission of being prophet, priest, and king. Right? And so that means that all of us are called to be prophets in this world, to exercise a kind of priesthood, I'll talk about that in a minute, and to exercise a kingly task, which is service. Um, and that's how we realize, doing that is how we work out, as it were, the call to holiness. The call to holiness is sharing in that task, but sharing it precisely where God has put us. Um, so the Second Vatican Council says that the laity, by their vocation, seek the kingdom of God precisely by engaging in ordinary secular temporal affairs but ordering them according to God. In other words, doing them with that love that St. Therese was talking about, or St. Paul was talking about. And so simply, they live in the world, in each and in all of the secular professions and occupations, in the ordinary circumstances of family life, social life, our friendships, our recreations, and there we're called to sanctify the world from within, like a leaven. And the fact is nobody, if we don't do it there, nobody else is going to do it, right? Because we're there and Father, say, isn't there in my family or in um, um, our workplace, etc. And so um, sanctifying the world from within as a leaven. And so how are we um, prophets? Simply by example, right? That's the... It's 99% example, and then, when necessary, use words. That's, uh, I, didn't, I butchered that. St. Francis says, um, preach always, um, and when necessary, use words. Yeah, there's a, um, Paul VI said, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if it does listen to teachers, it listens to them because they're witnesses. No, it's because of the witness of life. Okay. Now, one of the key places where we have to be witnesses in today's world is the reality of marriage and the family. Right? So simply by living the Christian life in marriage and the family, we are an incredible witness before the world. And again, people see that in our life and not so much in our speeches. So what's the kingly mission? So we're called to be kings as Christ is king, you know, to share in Christ's kingly mission. Right? So how did Christ um, exercise that kingship? Right? And the fact is, his throne, in effect, was the cross. He exercised his kingship by dying for us. 
by, um, and so kingship is exercised by service, um, a service that rightly orders society. Um, so we could say two things, basically. Um, service of neighbor and seeking the common good of society and ordering each one in his own place, um, our work, our family, um, school, um, homeschooling, education, whatever it may be, um, according to God's plan. Right? And that's our kingly, um, our kingly mission. And then finally, the priestly mission is to consecrate the world to God. And how do we do that? Again, part of it is simply what we just said, trying to live the Christian life. But and we consecrate it most of all by bringing it to the mass. Now, I, this is what I talked about last year when, in one of the talks on the sacrifice. I think. And this is one of the key points of the Second Vatican Council. And it, the council comes back to this idea in five or six different documents. And it says that the, the Eucharist is the source and summit of the church's life um, because Christ is made present there and Christ is offered to the Father. Um, and Christ is both priest, right? so Christ is eternal high priest, but on Calvary, he was priest and victim at the same time. So he offered other the priests in the Old Testament offered other things. No, they offered animals. Um, but Christ offered himself. And so a priest and victim. And so what do we offer when we come to Mass? Um, and so the fact is we share in offering Jesus Christ to the Father. The priest offers Christ to the Father in the person of Christ. Right? The priest lends his, his lips and his hands to Jesus Christ so that he can say, this is my body. But the whole church shares in the offering by offering Jesus to his Father. But we're asked to offer, to add something to the offering. Right? And what can we add to it? Um, maybe not great accomplishments, not a gold medal, not... Uh, um, but what we add is obviously is our heart. In other words, we add our desire to, um, to live as Christ wants us to live, to, to enter into that intimacy with us, with him. And so the Second Vatican Council says, basically encouraging priests to instruct the people that they are to offer themselves, their labors, all created things, together with Jesus Christ in the Mass. In other words, it's a way, uh, how should we put this? Um, we, can't, we can't exercise that priestly task of offering um, ourselves to the Father and Christ to the Father unless outside of Mass we're trying to live that holiness of life and be that witness in all the different parts of our life. And when we have that um, a coherence of life, in other words, when we're aiming at that one thing, we can bring the whole of our lives to the altar and offer that to the Father. Another text says, all, speaking about the lady, all their works, prayers, um, apostolic endeavors, that would be trying to um, um, make the gospel known to other people, their ordinary married and family life, their daily occupations, their mental and physical relaxations, if carried out in the spirit, so relaxation, doing sports, I don't know, whatever, listen to music, um, if carried out in the spirit and even the hardships of life, if patiently born, all these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to, to God through Christ that we can offer, right? So together with the offering of the Lord's body, they are most fittingly offered in the celebration of the Eucharist. And thus the laity consecrate the world itself to God. Basically, each one of, if each one of us brings our little sphere of life and our family and our um, recreations, our social um, relations, we try and live that according to Christ, we bring that to the Eucharist, and every one of us does that, then the whole world gets consecrated.
to God. Right? That's the mission of each one of us. But if only a few do it, then much of the world gets not offered. Right? In other words, it's, but if all the lady, imagine if the whole church took this seriously and offered their whole lives, um, that would bring about the new evangelization. So basically, the universal call to holiness, is, it's a wake-up call. Right? The fact is, that I think, that most of the faithful in the church, we tend to be too passive, right? We think that holiness is for somebody else and that the mission of the church is in the hands of somebody else, right? And so we could maybe think of the lady as a kind of sleeping giant that, if awakened, could change the world, right? And a great opportunity to do this is the time of Lent, right? So that's my challenge I'm throwing out there. Um, Questions? So related to that, we have some specific thoughts about that and how we use the period. Right. The beauty of Lent is that um, we can't, it's like uh, if you use a bow and arrow, you can't leave the bow always tense, right? It'll, it'll crack. And so you have to unstring it. And then you, um, and so our life is like that too. We can't always be, I don't know, um, um, at the highest intensity, right? And so Lent is an opportunity, basically, to exercise that virtue that I spoke about, L- big soldness, magnanimity, to really aspire to what's, um, what's really important, and that is precisely to try to grow in love. Right? That's the important thing. And so Lent is that um, an aid that the church gives us to string that bow um, and um, enter into a period of greater intensity um, in wanting to do what, what we always need to do, right? but we can't always do with the same intensity. Right? So Lent is a, is a great time for aspirations. Um, What's here? Larry, could you say a word about what's, from your experience, what are the barriers that a lot of people have? Say, well, okay. holiness, right? Because <laughs> you said some really nice things tonight. Uh huh. Like, okay. <laughs> right. So there's a, okay. There's a, there's this virtue magnanimity, in other words, aspiring to great things, but the fact is, all of us struggle with a contrary vice. And the contrary vice, again, has a fancy Latin name, pusillanimity, which means little soldness. And to be little sold is to shrink back from great things, and for very good reasons, because those great things involve commitment, they're gonna involve all kinds of difficulty, they're going to involve getting caught up in um, I don't know, service, in um, commitments, in, um, and um, we all have in us a certain repugnance um, to, um, to doing that, right? And so there's a, there's a great parable in the gospel that you all know about the talents. And so Jesus gives talent. He gives them in different quantities. So to one he gives five, another two, another one. And the person with five, what does he do? Doubles it. person with two doubles it. The person with one buries it. And what happens to the one? He didn't lose the one, but what happens to him? Jesus says, outer darkness with the wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's pretty strong. And um, so what's that about? That's about not aspiring, right? Not wanting to, for fi- and he gives the reason. The man dug a hole because he was afraid of losing it. In other words, he was afraid of failure. And that, um, in, the, in that gospel story, there's just one person who does that. But the fact is, that's a, obviously a temptation for all of us. And everyone does it to a certain amount, right? It's the saints, ultimately, who are the great sold ones the ones who really um, don't draw back out of fear of effort, commitment, 
failure, ridicule, etc. Um, uh, so that's part of the answer. Um, and then, I. Right. And the second thing I would say is, in natural things, it would be right to say, look, if somebody comes to tell me, you're going to be the greatest basketball player um, if you just work at it. Right, that's ridiculous. I'm never going to be that. But nobody can say that about holiness because it doesn't depend on our physique. It doesn't depend on our memory. It doesn't depend on how smart we are. But it depends how much we want to love, and that's it. Yeah. And so I can't do that cop-out when it, with regard to holiness, whereas it might be reasonable if it was, I don't know, um, learning uh, Japanese um, at my age. Um, I'd say... You want to stand and approach here. Mm -hmm. Why haven't you talked about St. Zemir, St. Maria? Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so um, I went to, um, I was eight years at a university in Rome that was, um, all my professors were Opus Dei priests. It was, it was a great place to study. Um, and so we got a lot of, um, I mean, the professors would put into their courses some of the key teachings of Opus Dei. And it just so happens that the, the key teaching of Opus Dei is that everyone is called to holiness, precisely what we were talking about um, tonight. Um, and... Um, well, the reason I didn't mention it, though, is because Jose Maria Saint Escrivá spoke about this back in the late 1920s and 30s, and I think he was in part responsible. His um, his efforts were in part responsible for um, that becoming a key theme at the Second Vatican Council, and so it's now not just a theme of a particular group in the Church, right? But it's the theme of Holy Mother Church, um, that we're all called to holiness. Um, but he has, um, Saint Escrivá has some beautiful homilies on this. And he, the key point that he makes is, um, again, that to work out holiness of life doesn't mean that I have to cross the ocean. I don't have to do something bizarre or strange, as sometimes the saints are called to do. You know? Saint Francis was called to do some strange things. Saint Francis of Assisi. Um, but to work out holiness, the principal thing is to live love heroically right where we are, right? W right where God has put us. And that means that the principal places in which we want to work it out is first the family, right? Because that's where we spend most of our time. And then secondly, the workplace. And then third, our friendships, our recreations. And doing precisely that, um, we will fulfill, um, if each one of us does that, we'll fulfill the mission of the laity in the church. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The question was, how do we keep up the rhythm after Lent ends? Right? So now it's Easter Sunday, Easter Monday. Um, and so, um, actually, the Easter season, everybody, I suppose, has a different favorite liturgical season. For a lot of people, it's probably Lent because it does force us to give more of ourselves. Um, personally, my favorite liturgical season is Easter because um, Christ has risen. And so Easter, each season calls forth a different response from us. And so Lent is sharing in Christ's sufferings, um, praying with him um, in his trials for us. But um, Easter is no less beautiful. We're called to share his joy then. Um, every, so the church wisely gives us a great um, different liturgical seasons, each one of which has a different um, gift to offer. Um, and um, the key thing is, is balance, right? To, to temper the, I don't know, the zeal of Lent with the joy of Easter. My favorite mass? You mean of the liturgical year? Well, it should be Easter Sunday. 
right? <laughs> and then I suppose a second should be Christmas but <laughs> for everybody. But uh, St. Therese says that the, the secret of every vocation is love. But how do we nourish love? I basically, that's the question. Um, and so the first thing is that we don't actually make it grow ourselves, right? So I can't, so the first we have to dispel a misconception that I'm supposed to be the one tilling and, and um, doing the push-ups and so forth. Um, because, so none of us can do it. And therefore we have to receive it, right? And so the, Catholic, the whole, call to holiness 101 is that we receive grace through the sacraments, through prayer, and through works done in charity. So basically, how do we grow in holiness? Three ways. We receive the sacraments, and above all, the ones that we can receive frequently, the Eucharist and confession. Um, but, and when we receive it, Jesus pledges himself to give more of that love to us. Right? So every time we receive communion in the right disposition, that means in a state of grace, we get an increase of love. Right? So that's the, that's the first way. But not everyone gets the same increase. Why not? Because we don't equally thirst. Right? And so if I receive communion desiring more love, I will get it. But if I go there thinking about something else and not thinking about that, I'll receive less. Right, so that would be the first way. The second way is prayer. And it's just, if this goal that we're holiness of life, we said it is a relationship. Right? It's becoming friends of God, sons of God, and spouses of God. Well, how do you nourish a relationship? You better talk to the person that you want to have a relationship with, right? If I don't speak to my spouse where is she? Um, every day for a considerable amount of time, our relationship will not improve. And even if I'm on a business trip, I better cut out a significant amount of time for a good phone call. Um, and so it's the same thing in our relationship with God. If I, and so we can, it's a barometer or it's like a temperature. So if I want to see the barometer of my relationship with God, how much time do I want to spend with him? That will tell me right away how I'm doing. Um, and then what we do in that time of prayer is really, I think, I'm sorry, not so ultimately important. And so it's every, there are lots of different methods of prayer and we can, I don't know, do Ignatian prayer or contemplative prayer or Carmelite prayer, but Ultimately, the key thing is wanting to spend time with the Lord. And it doesn't matter that much um, how we, uh, I don't know, how the tec um, technique's not important. Um, it's love that's important. Right? And then the third way that we grow in grace and holiness is um, what comes out of that, right? So having received love sacramentally, receiving the Eucharist, praying and getting that deeper relationship, that spurs us to live charity, to live love with our neighbor. And every time we do that, God again pledges himself by way of justice even to give us an increase, right? Because he says, no one who gives a glass of water, right, to someone because they're a disciple of mine will not get a reward. And the reward isn't some exterior thing. The reward is giving us a greater capacity to love. Yeah. So that's how I would put the ABCs or the intro to holiness. Great question. <laughs> and then, of course, it can't hurt to have a spiritual guide, but um, they may get overloaded. But that would be a good thing, overload them, especially in the confessional. <laughs> okay, so it's the enemy of holiness, but, so sin is the one thing that, that undermines it, right? And so there are two kinds, a grave sin, a mortal sin, kills it. 
Venial sins don't kill it, but they, they make it harder to exercise. Right? Because if I get in a habit of venial sin, that's basically a habit of not living charity in, in small things. And so it's holding, it's, it's binding that um, aspiration to, um, to grow in love. Um, but there's this beautiful line of St. Paul that um, for those who love God, everything works to good. Right? Now, he's immediately speaking about persecutions, sufferings, illnesses. But I think we can add in there even past sins. They too can work for good because they provide a magnificent opportunity for growing in humility and for not trusting in myself but in God and for recognizing that I'm, yeah, that my neighbor um, is better than me in so many ways. Right? And so our past sins aren't, aren't an obstacle to that growth and holiness once they've been taken away by a good repentance and confession. Right? And we see that in the lives of the saints. St. Augustine wouldn't have been St. Augustine if he hadn't uh, done those sins that he tells about in his confessions, but he repented of them. All right, because that's an, I should have, for Monsignor Ulrich's question, when, ah, it's impossible. The, the principal reason why we say it's impossible is precisely because of those past sins. I can't do that. Look what I've done. And so the fact is, everything works to good. And so even the, those past sins are no excuse to being called to holiness. Because in some sense, they can even help us by, by giving us more, more compassion for ourselves and our neighbor. Because right? you want to make up. Right? And so again, it can be a spur. So St. Augustine has this great line in the Confessions, late have I loved you because he was 29 when he converted. Late have I loved you. And so he regrets that he, w he didn't use some 11 years of his life um, for glorifying God. But that helps him, right? Because he wants to make up for it, to make up for the lost time. Right. Right. So, th so the temptation, again, is to say, look, I'm going to give up. Right? And who, who wants us to do that? Satan. Right? That's Satan's, that's like Satan 101. Satan 101 is to get you to do these habitual things. We all have habitual habits of sin. And so Satan's most used tactic is to lead us to think because we keep on stumbling in the same way that it's hopeless. Right? That's the, the thing. And um, so I I think what we should do with those habits of sin is recognize because of our past, um, sin, one of the things, that sin leaves wounds. It leaves wounds obviously in others, but it leaves wounds in ourself as well. And that wound in ourself is it makes it a lot harder to get out of that habit. Um, and therefore, um, um, now, what does God think about that? He knows that wound and what he wants is the heart, right? He doesn't want this outward perfection. He wants the heart given over. All right. That means that recognizing that I have some of these habits and that therefore um, uh, I have to rely on his mercy and that it's not my strength, etc., that can actually be helpful and not harmful to our spiritual life, right? The harmful thing would be to think, I shouldn't go back to the confessional because I've already confessed this last week and the week before. But what should we think, right? That if I do it frequently, then I need frequent help. And the fact is, every time we make a good confession, um, we get um, two kinds of grace. We get um, sanctifying grace restored, if we lost it by a grave sin, but we also get what's called sacramental grace to strengthen us in precisely the area that we confessed. And we may not see it. We may not see the results. And part of the reason why we don't see the results is because God doesn't want us to see the results very often. Because it's easy to think, wow, you know, I'm, growing, I'm, I'm doing well. 
And that's when we fall. And, and it's much more helpful for us to think, I'm not doing so well, and therefore I need to um, rely on him, on his grace. I need to give myself over better. I need to... Um, um, so those occasions um, are... Right, we shouldn't get discouraged when we have to burden our priest with the same confessions frequently. <laughs> but we should... Um, all the more um, do that so as to be strengthened, forgiven, and, um, and God looks at the heart. That was a great question. I'm sorry I didn't uh, do justice to it. Uh, right, God's, in, God's mercy in our... Mer- the fact is, we, in our relationships, we're always... We're not content... Um, we want the other person to do it in a sense themselves, right? Our spouse or, or something like that. If they're um, not living up to our expectations. But God knows that we can't do it ourselves. And so it's got to be his gift. And again, that's why what Satan wants from us is to get discouraged so we don't go back to him to get the gift. Thank you. Uh, touch a little bit on sacramental grace. That's one of the things that uh, people don't realize. It's there. You know, priests, mm-hmm. you know, they got their sacrament. But in sacrament of matrimony. Mm, fantastic. You know, fantastic. fantastic. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. It's an inside step. Right. But you've got to be functioning together. Right. Before you're going to get anything out of it. Right. So all the sacraments give us graces for the purpose that they were instituted for. Um, So let's look at the sacrament of matrimony. So the sacrament of matrimony is so that it's basically the couple as an image of the love of Christ and his church, God and his creation. And therefore, um, the sacrament calls forth all the graces that we need throughout our married life to do that. But the way it works is that one grace leads to another, which leads to another, right? It's a dynamic thing. God doesn't give us all those graces of a particular sacrament all at once. He gives them to us in a way that starts us and such that one grace builds on grace if we cooperate. And there's no, the beautiful thing is that, again, there's no limit to it. We said in other things like, I don't know, <clears throat> intelligence, we've got a limit. Um, athletic uh, power, we've got a limit. Grace, there's no limit, but we have to cooperate, and grace builds on grace. So throughout our married life, married couples can always call on the sacramental grace of that sacrament. But in order for it to be fruitful, we need to be in a state of grace, and that's what enables those graces to. And the same thing would be true of our baptism. We can always call on the grace of our baptism to live as sons of God and members of his church, and the grace of confirmation. So basically, another way of having done this talk would be precisely, at confirmation, we've all been, well, at baptism, we're made members of the church. At confirmation, we're made adult members called to share in Christ's mission, prophet, priest, and king. And that means that we have sacramental grace to do that. But again, a sacramental grace that's not given all at once. Fortunately, right? Because we wouldn't be able to take it when we were 13 and got confirmed or whatever. And so it's, we're given um, the title, the right, uh, that sounds funny to speak about right to grace, but that's what the sacraments give us, the title to all the graces we need to live out our baptism, our confirmation, our marriage, our priesthood. Great. So they gave it to you all at one time. That's right. Mm-hmm. 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 Right. And it, it, we'll get those graces whether we are aware of it and ask for them directly or not. But it's helpful to be aware of them and to ask for them. All right. Right. And the same thing goes for confession. Right. 
the sacrament of grace of confession is precisely to strengthen us against what we've confessed. And therefore, we can call on those graces when we're tempted. But we usually forget that. And the grace of the Eucharist, the sacramental grace of the Eucharist, is, is love. Because the Eucharist is the sacrament of love in which Jesus nourishes us in love by giving himself to us totally. Right? And so we can call on the grace of the Eucharist um, to love more. Next week, we have Father James Mason, who's the new rector of the seminary. And he's coming in, and he's going to be talking to us about evangelization. And evangelization is just it's a big word of, okay, I have these friends and neighbors of mine. How do I spread the faith? How do I share my faith with them? And I have no idea what approach he's going to take, but it promises to be good. So uh, please come back next week. <laughs>